Hello and welcome to the Ask Assad Show. I'm Michael Gaines and glad you are joining us today as we continue our conversations on bringing insight out from experts throughout NOV and around the world and look forward to having you join us uh, in today's conversation where uh, we are going to be kicking off a uh, ongoing series uh, looking at energy transition and the different uh, aspects and components that uh, that make up that that phrase really what what are those those ideas and concepts and technology and how are those items really shaping the energy transition landscape that's what we're going to be uh, talking about today and uh, we'll get to Assad and our guests in just one moment before we do we are going to pivot over to Ben Lasher who is actually sitting in for Shelby Dumain today she's on vacation, uh, probably in, enjoying the, the great world of vacationing, wherever that, that might be. Uh, I haven't taken a vacation in a while. I don't know, Ben, uh, have you taken a vacation recently? I don't think so. I, uh, I if it was, you're a small guy. Yeah, I know. I, I need to, I need to uh, really, really jump in. But I, I wanted to uh, maybe get you to help provide some insight, Ben, into how folks can be a part of today's conversation. Sure, sure. So there are a few different ways you can get involved. Um, and, you know, we encourage that. We hope you can, uh, you can send a question or a comment to, to one, of, one of our outlets. We have a few different ones. So you can email uh, askassad at nov.com. Um, you can send a comment or question there, or you can call the comment line at uh, country code 1-346-223-4799. Um, or as always, you can leave a comment on, uh, on any of our platforms, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, or Facebook. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and we look forward to those comments as well. I mean, people say, "Well, I don't, I don't think you have." I have the phones right here, so I mean, we we get we're ready to get get the the calls if you want to 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 give us a call or, or anything like that. But yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, your comments and and feedback uh, on today's show and other shows. So thanks, Ben. All right, so uh, we wouldn't have the Ask Assad show with uh, out an Assad to ask. So I want to introduce uh, Saad Mahana, uh, NOV's Director of Business Strategy. Hey, Assad, how you doing? Very good. How are you, Michael? Oh, man, I am doing well, doing well. Glad to be here, as always, uh, to, to talk about these really interesting uh, concepts and, uh, and ideas. I know that you've always got a, an ear to the ground. Um, and to that point, uh, wanted to maybe jump in and, and uh, kind of get your your perspective on things that, as always, that we talk about at the top of the show, things that have happened in the last last week or so that have really uh, caught caught your eye or, and uh, kind of the eye of those that are kind of watching uh, the energy space. So what's what's uh, top of mind for you uh, do, on today's show this week? Just before we get in, what do you, what do you think about my uh, new camera setup, Michael? I don't oh. know if you noticed that. Is that uh, looking uh, good? I, you know, it, it, it looks crystal clear. I mean, I got, I, I'm not complaining about your previous setup, but this one, I mean, it's like, I, I feel like I can just, just reach out and give you a digital hug, which is probably the safest type of hug I can give you. So A, 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 good, a good buddy of mine uh, set me up with it a couple of days ago. I don't know if you know him. His name is uh, Michael Gaines. He's a pretty good chap. Yeah, I don't know. That sounds like a shady character. We'll uh, we'll just bypass <laughs> bypass that one. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, yes. Thank uh, you, Michael. Um, I think uh, today uh, is one of the first uh, episodes in a series um, about energy transition. We're going to be talking about in this show. Um, uh, we know renewable energy uh, has been. A, uh, a topic uh, that's uh, garnered a lot of attention, uh, not only in the past six months, uh, but also uh, really uh, in the last couple of years where we've seen big companies uh, change strategies, change direction, change names, um, uh, grow in different directions, restructure organizations so that they fit in the energy transition aspect uh, into what they do. Um, I think we all agree that renewable energy uh, will play an increasingly uh, important role um, 
in, in meeting the world's growing demand for, for energy in the coming decades. Uh, and when we, when we talk about renewable energy, we're referring primarily, primarily to uh, solar energy, wind, uh, geothermal, and biomass. There are some others, but really those are the ones that have seen dramatic drops in costs in the last uh, decade or two. Um, we know oil and gas is competing for investor money uh, with uh, other spaces. We know that our industry is going through uh, a challenging time. So companies have found themselves in a position where they had to reinvent and align with uh, public demand, but also in how things are going in a more responsible um, uh, uh, and, and sustainable energy uh, generation uh, into the uh, the future. Um, so uh, really the energy mix as we see it going forward, I think is, is not just gonna be driven by what's out there, the resources available, but um, what the customer's choice is going to be to a certain extent. So um, as more and more of uh, that cost is eliminated from renewable energy sources, we're gonna see um, uh, more of those spaces grow going forward. And I want to bring in an example, and I want to uh, 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 mention BP and what they've done recently. A, a major shift in strategy, only I think a couple hours ago, they came up with this plan of um, uh, 20 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity by 2025, which I think is a, a, a pretty ambitious goal from their currently functioning 2.5 gigawatt of re renewable energy. Um, that's, of course, uh, if you haven't heard the news after uh, they've announced a $1.1 billion investment in the offshore wind uh, assets uh, with Equinor to have a 50% stake in those. Um, and that's in two, two major offshore wind projects in the northeast of the U.S. Uh, one is uh, Empire Wind. That's a two gigawatt uh, wind farm off of Long Island. And the other is uh, Bacon uh, Wind, that's Beacon, not Bacon, uh, with 2.4 gigawatt of uh, capacity off of the coast of Massachusetts. I hope I said that right. Um, uh, the 2020 Energy Outlook uh, report from BP is a highly anticipated report that also just came out and predicted a almost up to tenfold increase in renewable energy um, in the next few decades, even their worst case or do business uh, as usual uh, case uh, predicts growth in the renewable space. All of that really to tee up and say that our topic today about geothermal is extremely timely. Uh, we also saw from Slumberger an announcement saying that they're teeing up uh, or teaming up with a company to uh, provide geothermal project development capabilities. Uh, another example of organizations restructuring to align with that future. So. Um, really, uh, I'm excited about this first energy transition series episode. Uh, we're going to be talking about geothermal energy today. And uh, I'll let you, uh, Michael, introduce, introduce our uh, uh, special guests. Sure, yeah. So our, our guests are, are certainly no, no strangers to the geothermal uh, conversation, so, uh, some, some of which have been on the program before. So I want to introduce... Uh, we have Tony Pink, who is the VP of technology within the Wellboard Technology segment here uh, in NOV. And we also have uh, Hiro Vendebos, who's the director of uh, business development uh, within NOV as well. So, uh, Hiro and uh, 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 Tony, Thank thanks you. for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. So, glad, glad to have you here. I, I know that you guys are are always uh, 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 really always kind of talking about th this this approach, especially in geothermal within NOV, and and I know it's it's some people are surprised that it's it's not new to to NOV. So I think this will be a really good good conversation. Maybe I can um, maybe lead us off here, um, and and I know Assad has has really been looking forward to the the conversation as well. Um, but maybe Tony, I'll I'll start with you. So yeah, like I said, it's. Geothermal really isn't new yeah. to, to NOV, and I think for you, it's not really new as well. So maybe you yeah, can kind of talk yeah. about um, um, you know, what it looks like. Geothermal as a, as a renewable energy has probably been around uh, the, the second longest after hydro. Yeah. So, you know, geothermal as a, as a technology, um, you know, 
uh, drilling into uh, rocks that have a uh, uh, significant thermal heat capacity, uh, you know, has been a uh, a energy source that our world has exploited. Yeah, and and what we're really seeing now is uh, with the with the energy transition as a as a whole, you have um, wind, solar, uh, you have uh, all this innovation in this space. But the, the, the big challenge there is, you know, what is going to replace the base load uh, when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't uh, uh, blowing? So we're really starting to see as the energy transition picks up pace, that renewed look and focus back to uh, geothermal uh, to how do we, uh, how do we uh, capture that energy at night and in the in 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 calm conditions and and really if you think about it you know a geothermal's competitor is, is really energy storage or batteries yeah so the alternative to geothermal is storing all this wind and solar energy in in batteries yeah uh, and batteries really have their own you know environmental issues with it you know the batteries are made of uh, you know heavy metals uh, has to be mined you know, so if, if we're going to look at, you know, that really, really green uh, in the, uh, energy portfolio, geothermal has a has a really fantastic place in it. And and from a NOV point of view, it, geothermal requires drilling, you know, and, and drilling really through some of the most challenging rocks that uh, that, that you have. So where we as a company are making advances in, in, in drilling technology, you know the 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 moonshot in the geothermal sort of world is is really to be able to steer wells that have temperatures above 350 degrees Fahrenheit, and to get let's say an ROP of something like 20 meters an hour in granite. Yeah, so you know we we're, we're talking about you know those two moonshots. If we can solve those. Um, and put that energy and focus into that you know i think we have a huge opportunity as an industry and nov obviously in the in the realms of you know building all this kit for uh for drilling you know it's it's a fantastic opportunity for us yeah so so maybe if i if i kind of i like what you said there it's uh it's it's kind of saying the earth is the battery uh for geothermal and we don't have to well some places could rely on wind and solar for base load, uh, those two sources are not continuous sources. So geothermal fills that gap, whether you use it in location or you feed it into the grid. Correct. Um, what what makes uh, what makes geothermal, I guess, today? Um, uh, uh, you know, we, we we're talking how how it's how it's becoming more relevant. Uh, but really, really, my question is, what how do, how do you see geothermal apply? Uh, with the ge with oil and gas um, and oil and gas capabilities as as they are today, you want to go for that, Guido? Yeah, no, it's a it's a perfect mix in in that sense because um, you still have the same needs and requirements for both geothermal and the traditional oil and gas uh, onshore. So, looking at uh, just at the rigs or the equipment sides that are uh, transferable in that sense. Yeah. Um, there is for the rig side. There is only limited uh, adjustments needed to uh, to drill the to, to drill these wells. Yeah. Uh, the challenges even lies on if you go further than let's say six kilometers or seven kilometers deep, then of course uh, definitely uh, the rig requirements will will need to increase. But uh, the principles remain the same. So, so Huido, maybe tell us a little on on the breakdown of the cost. Is that uh, identical to what we see in oil and gas, or is it a bit different? Yeah, if you look, and and, and I definitely have to um, combine because there's different ways of of power plants and, and depending on temperature. But if you really take the average, then we're looking about 50, 55 percent for the power plant and how to yeah. install it and how to maintain it through the twenty or thirty years of uh, well life, and then the drilling side is between twenty or twenty five percent. Uh, and then the remaining part is about infrastructure, uh, project management, and of course insurance as well. If you go beyond, I uh, said earlier, if they go really deep geothermal, 
towards six, seven kilometers, then of course the drilling side will take a, a bigger pie. Uh, so it's about 30, 35% of that. And I guess the expectation is the more evolved and more cost is shaved off, the more complex and harsh the environment will get. Is that is that a fair assumption? Yeah, there's a there's a fair assumption, correct. And you know, and the and the and, and Assad, there's a there's a really good sort of broad spectrum of geothermal as well, yeah. Uh, and that and that spectrum is uh, and if you if you if you if you start to be live on the on the on the geothermal uh, um, hubs and and uh, and websites, you start to see that you know it's it's really nice to hear that there's you know just like as we developed oil and gas things, you know you can do lots and lots of cheap shallow wells, and then uh, a number of uh, deeper wells, and then obviously eventually some some very deep or very long wells, yeah. But you're starting to see the pace of the um, not the, the sort of one step above heat pumps growing in Europe as well, uh, and, and and we we see particular focus that on Europe, and there's no reason why that focus couldn't move to the United States, where a building no longer needs to consume energy for heating or cooling uh, because it has a uh, uh, you know a medium depth uh, geothermal uh, well. Uh, cooling or warming uh, the building, you know, and so yeah. then innovation from NOV is, oh, you know, can we get, you know, a lightweight drilling rig into the parking lot of every hospital and office building in uh, in Europe and, uh, and 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 drill a well that uh, reduces the energy footprint of the, of that building, exactly. yeah, and even reduce the carbon footprint, right? Just connect it to the grid, and you yeah. you bump right. your uncle almost, yeah. So, so maybe uh, a quick follow up then to to your your uh, really the points that both of you made, but but Tony, I'm just kind of curious your thoughts, uh, just kind of leading off here. When you look at uh, again, kind of the comparison, and and really, it's just since it's it's different, right? So we're trying to get a get a gauge or get a level set. So when you're looking at the supply chain uh, from a, a geothermal side, or really the value chain, what what does that look like, and how do you compare that? Um, with respect to traditional oil and gas yeah i guess traditional oil and gas you've got uh the the oil company uh the drilling contractor the service companies and the equipment manufacturers yeah uh where geothermal is a little bit more different is uh the 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 replacement of the oil company uh is a very wide ranging uh set of groups yeah it, it can be a, a utility company. It can be a, a, a local government administration, you know, a city or a, a, a county. And it can be a, um, uh, you know, a direct ge geothermal company who are exploiting that. So that's complex. And what that means is that, uh, you know, inbuilt in that, there is not necessarily the expertise on how to execute it. So uh, what Guido and I are seeing a lot of is that there, there's a there's a need out there in the industry and an extra cost at the moment for uh, the you know, the engineering resources to do this. So those those groups say a, you know a a regional government in Germany has to then go and find someone to uh, effectively project manage the whole thing. Uh, Whereas in the in the, in the oil and gas, that project management is is effectively done by the the operator themselves, so that puts an extra extra layer of cost into it, and that and that's that's kind of the the biggest difference between them. You want to mm -hmm. add to that, Guido? Yeah. yeah, especially if you focus that on on Europe, you definitely see more governmental bodies and cities uh, taking control of these uh, uh, projects. Uh, look uh, around Paris or around Germany. And of course, the, like Tony stated, the, the expertise is not in-house, so they have to rely on the industry to advise them in, in the right way, in the right to set up in order to, uh, to deliver these uh, projects uh, in an economical scale. So, uh, so the client base is slightly different and the, the support has to come from the industry instead of the, the other way around. It, it, it's a heat of the end. Oh, go, go ahead, Asad. I, I'm, I'm as excited as you are, so, but you got it. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll I'll, uh, I'll follow up on that just uh, on, on Huido's point. It sounds like that whole space is is pretty ripe for uh, designing the right business models today and not having to follow mm -hmm. through with what's happening in oil and gas. 
kind Definitely. of get out from that exact same value chain and apply one that's a bit more efficient is there is there an opportunity like that out there i think uh, i think definitely yeah. you know uh you know the, the, there's an opportunity uh for uh, an equipment company to uh provide a package to a uh turnkey per, uh, o- operator to be able to deliver this and uh, drive a significant amount of cost out of it the other, the other big transition mm. that the industry needs is that, and that, that we've seen is the, an, an, an openness to, to change uh, and, and investing money in the right place. Yeah? Yeah. Um, a lot of the geothermal projects have been driven by uh, government money um, and you know, they do as much as they can with the pot. So what happens then is they, they tend to uh, um, you know, spend a long time doing things cheaply. Um, yeah. Whereas the, the big lesson to, to, to learn is to start doing things um, much more, uh, you know, drill f- uh, faster, quicker, uh, and drive down the overall cost of, of, the, of the project by not having that rig tied to that location for 120 days, getting it down to 60 days. And then you start to open up so many more uh, projects uh, that become economic uh, once you drive down that, 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 that drilling increase the drilling speed or drive down the the time on the location yeah yeah mm. so hiro how do you see you know because we, we've talked a lot uh, a bit here already just about a lot of the the synergies and and compliments um that we see certainly some some differences as well um but I, I think one of the the benefits that we've talked about is that there's really an opportunity to leverage a lot of the lessons learned a lot of the the you know, un- untold amounts of resources that have been invested historically into refining, uh, you know, the oil and gas side of things to to apply to a space like like geothermal. So, how do you see a lot of those, you know, traditional oil and gas, um, you know, kind of operational tech, uh, you know, kind of technology knowledge uh, 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 lessons learned and seeing that transfer over into the geothermal side? Yeah. What does what does that look like uh, from your from what you've, you've uh, experienced? The- the, the, the principles remain the same, right? We need to be cost effective. It needs to be safe so people can go home safely to their to their families, the repetitiveness and the precision of the drilling. So if you really look at uh, that, you still need high quality of equipment with skilled people that train and know how to handle that. Uh, and then that's stated earlier. Yeah, sometimes if you have a tendering process, you look at price and then you have a tendency to be uh, penny wise pound foolish because you'll pay on the long term. In the oil and gas, we're now moving more and more towards the automation side. So to get more repetitiveness, uh, there's a good thing on that as well, apart from safety, of course, uh, to get people away from the rig floor. In some countries, there is a limit in, in, in shift hours. So there are areas in the world where you're only allowed to work eight hours uh, on the rig instead of 12 hours. So suddenly, yeah, instead of two shifts, you have three shifts. So the, the headcount increases dramatically. So with the automation side and robotics, you take people away, and you need less people to perform the same uh, operation. Um, and of course, the, the predictive maintenance, the big data, so get the cost out of the, uh, for the drilling contractor. Uh, for for the maintenance side, so he he knows when it's coming, so he's prepared. So he's more proactive than reactive, and of course, we're still um, and you see it on land as well already in the oil and gas. Yeah, if if you're able to connect the rig to the grid, yeah, you, you immediately uh, turn off your your diesel generators, and you still have the the same uh, operational capabilities. Uh, what, what I'm hearing, uh, Huido, is uh, on, on the surface equipment and the rig equipment aspect of things, there are a bunch of things that again can be implemented today and right away, um, kind of taking some lessons learned, whether it's automation, it's robotics, it's demanding, it's upskilling, um, and really connecting digital with, with all that automation and, and clean data. Um, I want to I want to go into that same uh, maybe uh, level of detail with with Tony, um, perhaps on the well construction aspect and what goes down hall. Uh, we're talking about high temperature stuff, um, a high likelihood of corrosion, things can break. Yeah. Um, wh- what are your thoughts there? 
Yeah, so I mean, the 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 unique challenges, yeah, and th and this came up in the you know, and maybe some of the listeners joined on the Pivot 2020 conversation that was recently uh, broadcast worldwide, uh, driven out of the University of Texas. Yeah, you know, the, uh, one of the biggest challenges is, or what, what, one of the big changes that revolutionized drilling was uh, uh, going from vertical to horizontal. Yeah. Yep. You know, the, the shale revolution was driven by horizontal drilling, exposing a large surface area of rock with poor permeability to get the maximum amount of hydrocarbons out of it. So the same applies with geothermal. You want to expose the largest surface area of rock that has heat in it to a cool fluid that's coming down the borehole so you can heat it. Yeah. Our, our big problem is, is there is an absolute ceiling on that at the moment at 350 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, yeah, or 165 uh, centigrade, yeah, and uh, to go uh, beyond that, we uh, we really uh, need some substantial innovation, yeah. So that that that's one change that has to occur. Guido touched on the automation. I think there's a massive opportunity for for automation uh, on the uh, 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 at the surface, uh, and then the uh, uh, the next one is the contact area between the uh, cutting structure and the uh, uh, and the rock yeah so there are some big jumps in technology going on in oil and gas with uh, very uh, deep thick diamond cutters now and uh, the shape and profile of those cutters yeah so I, I i think there's some research going on at the moment in the combination of uh, uh, hydraulic hammering shape cutters uh, uh, to potentially give us an opportunity to to maybe break that speed barrier that we uh, that we're all stuck in in the moment with uh, with geothermal and open up the speed, yeah. Okay. So I mean I know uh, I think aside maybe we have a a couple or maybe one one or two more questions that we have, but but we've also gotten some that have have come in. So um, maybe I'll let you kind of round it out and then we can sure. turn it over to some of the, the comments and questions that have uh, been coming in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, th this is this is fabulous. I mean, uh, just the ability of understanding what that space is. I guess one question to, to both of you, kind of closing before we move to Q&A, Tony and Huido. Um, in, in terms of us as an organization, as NOV, we, we've built we've built rigs, uh, we've built downhole equipment, uh, we've gone through these applications over and over. And we've talked a little bit about uh, the unique aspects that we're able to provide. Um, I kind of want to give you the floor to tell us a little bit, what, what is it that uh, your businesses, your segments, NOV as a whole, uh, can can bring in terms of value added. Really, how how is this going to make a dent to what's already out there, or the efforts that have already taken place in the last six months, yeah. two years, or ten? You yeah. start, Dieter. Yeah, yeah, I'll kick it off. Uh, well, you can definitely see because yeah, uh, NV has always been an equipment provider uh, with various levels of services, so fluid side or inspection side. Any, any well that's drilled, either geothermal or in gas, will, with the drill pipe still has to be inspected. So you still need tuberscope to, to do that. But if you look at the, the services and the equipment, it's the drilling contractors are able to take more, more services on board to, to take a bigger chunk of the, uh, the contracts. So by doing that and, and integrate more into the, their system. So while, for instance, while running casing, you don't have to hire another crew to do the casing running. A, a drilling contractor can do that. So again, it's a headcount saving and we're keeping people occupied at the same time. And then, of course, we'll, and probably Tony will touch on it later, we're looking at directional drilling, added services for fluids and solid controls, or maybe looking at MPD. So the effort, the integration part is, is very substantial, where which is typical different approach than an IPM where all services are on one contract, but the headcount is not reduced. Do you want anything, Tony? Yeah, I guess the the, the 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 sort of one that's been going on most recently is you know a lot of the geothermal people have uh, corrosion issues, yeah. And uh, one of the you know the solution that a lot of people have been going for for uh, solving cor corrosion issues is is you know going to m materials or pipes that. Uh, uh, prevent that corrosion that are incredibly expensive. Yeah, so you're looking at chromium, titanium, all sorts of exotic metals. Uh, 
Um, and we've seen a big uptick in uh, business in, 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 a, in a much more simple um, uh, liner to conventional pipe. You know, and this is, you know, saving the uh, geothermal companies a, a fortune in basically just a, uh, a an all field standard uh, uh, plastic liner to conventional uh, piping and a, and, a, and a clever seal mechanism so that uh, they they reduce their costs uh, uh, massively in, in getting those fluids to the surface without destroying the tubing and piping that that it's that it's going through. So that's one really exciting and then and then some there's definitely some you know uh, NOV at the moment really are uh, kind of in the groundbreaking realm with cutter uh, technology for diamond um, the reed high clog part of NOV has been known to be that be in that realm but we've had some really really uh, recent uh, uh, innovations that uh, are delivering some e excellent results in the hard rock drilling conventional geothermal at the moment yeah so yeah some very good stuff Fabulous. Good, good. Yeah, I think I, I like we we said before. I think this is a really, really interesting space to continue to to have conversations on. I know that uh, that that we're going to continue to to do that here on on this show, and I'm sure throughout the uh, the coming weeks and months and 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 days and days, we'll we'll continue to see because I, I I suspect if as it already has, and we'll continue to to grow and and certainly. Uh, Garner additional conversations like this. So I, I think we're going to pivot over real quick to Ben to uh, to get some of the the, the Q and A, and I, I think uh, you've got one on on deck for us, Ben. Yeah. So we had uh, we had a couple of different questions, um, particularly around uh, you know the high temperatures that geothermal wells can can have and the effects it has on the electronics and the ability to mm. transmit data in real time. So I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit about that. Mm. Man, I yeah, that's that uh, yeah, from the downhole days long ago, it's just like you never get away from high temp downhole like it doesn't matter what kind of it's it's always but it's a good conversation. It's a good, it good is, topic. It's a, it's, a, it's, yeah. it's a good it's a good conversation and um, yeah. we do uh we do have a uh we have a project going uh on at the moment with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in uh, in De in Denver in Colorado uh to build the most simple chip chipset that we could possibly look at. And that was to be able to measure um, b uh, vibration and uh, the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, so acceleration and, uh, and ma uh, magnetics uh, using, uh, rather than silicon dioxide, which normal chips are made, uh, making doing it with gallium oxide, yeah. And uh, we are, having some pleasantly positive uh, results out of this, but this is literally right on the very edge of, uh, uh, of science. And uh, the Department of Energy are uh, 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 liking what we're doing. And we're hoping that uh, in, the, in the next round next year that we'll, we'll get some funding. The, the, the aim of the game is to build a tool uh, that knows where it's going at 400 degrees centigrade, yeah. So, uh, but that's a, that's, that is quite a long way off, uh, that the time for that being around will be shortened depending on, on, on money coming in from, 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 uh, outside sources. Yeah. Yeah. And on top of that, you can still also use uh, a high level of uh, circulation to, to drop the temperature down hole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, if, if you've got a good set of pumps, you can drop the temperature very easily by 80 degrees Celsius. So. Mm. Man, I, I tell you, it it is it, it really is an interesting uh, interesting space, and and I think to your your point, uh, both both Guido and and Tony, your last point about you know continuing to work with uh, with other entities. I know that uh, you know collaboration. You talking about the name of the game. I know that's certainly one of the pieces that uh, that we're we're yeah uh, jumping yeah. We into. I think we heard so. Michael. We heard we heard the word consortia really coming out mm -hmm. in the yep. in the, in the pivot 2020. Yeah. That it's it's going to take a uh, an NOV a uh, a combined with uh, a, a large service company potentially and uh, or a couple of service companies and a couple of operators and and, okay. and put it all together into one consortia to to do this sort of drilling drilling moonshot again yeah mm. um, and you know what we did you know with deep water in the Gulf of Mexico and around the world and what we've done with horizontal drilling if we can do those. You know, we can we can crack this nut, and right. uh, 
uh, and produce this, uh, you know, 24 hour supply of, uh, of energy using the, the, the Earth's, uh, you know, energy resource. Yeah. So, and, and, and if you're addressing things like uh, extremely high temperatures and corrosion issues, that's that's already two of the major bottlenecks that you're seeing in that space that would probably drive down your cost significantly, making this uh, as or less uh, costly than other renewable sources, which is a, a great uh, move into that space. Great. All right. Well, look forward to uh, look forward to the next time that we circle around and and uh, see where uh, where things have headed. But uh, in the meantime, been having a conversation on geothermal. Uh, geothermal energy and the overall space with uh, Tony Pink and uh, Hudo van der Bos, who uh, Hudo stood up, stayed up a little late for us, uh, joining us from uh, from the Netherlands. So, uh, guys, thanks for uh, for joining and, and sharing your expertise today. Really appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having us. Bye, Bye appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Yeah. All right. So, Assad, I know that we are going to continue this ongoing series again, kind of in the the uh, idea of uh, of energy transition and having you know additional guests and and uh, and those can talk to it. And I think next week we uh, we have another special guest that'll be uh, be talking to us. That's right. Uh, next week uh, we do have someone special. Before I, I say who that is, uh, kind of on the energy transition yeah. uh, topic. Um, uh, yes, we'll be like we heard today about uh, geothermal. Uh, we'll unwrap. Uh, some more topics as we go forward, um, uh, of which will be uh, wind uh, energy. Uh, I think that's going to be the uh, the next episode uh, about energy transition. Now, next week, to your point, Michael, we have a uh, a special guest um, uh, that's going to be uh, Joseph El Curi. Uh, that's uh, Kese Doitag's uh, CEO, uh, who's going to talk to us about uh, how. A, one of the larger uh, drilling contractors uh, have weathered the storm uh, and uh, what kind of are some of the skill sets uh, that are required going forward uh, to uh, keep uh, keep uh, holding up um, and growing. So uh, excited about that one uh, for sure. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So that should be uh, should be good. Yeah. Well, I'm joining you there and looking looking forward to that that conversation as well. So uh, uh, really uh, appreciate the, the insight and analysis, Assad. And, and as always, uh, as I think as you say, bringing uh, bringing insight out. So uh, thanks for uh, all of your your time prep and uh, and uh, insight it, sharing here. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, certainly appreciate everyone online joining us. Uh, from uh, we saw from many countries around the world. So we always appreciate not only your viewership, but your comments and feedback. So if there's anything we can do to uh, make this uh, a more uh, in, insightful or um, uh, educational or, or a conversation, certainly uh, send us a note at askasad at nov.com. And uh, we'd be more than happy to, to get your thoughts, uh, feedback or, or comments. So from all of us here at NOV, thank you for joining us and for watching and listening, and we'll talk to you later.